you are listening to Cemetery Confessions, the world's number one goth talk podcast. Hello and welcome back to Cemetery Confessions. On this episode, we are aiming to provide a jumping off point for new goths, a sort of introductory crash course, uh, a, a baby bat 101, as it were. And I see this question online all the time. People post about being new to the scene and asking what music to listen to, where to buy clothing, how to find a local scene. And so this episode aims to be a curated starting point. Our guests this time are from all over the age spectrum, from 19 to over 50 and everywhere in between, which should provide a variety of insight and a broad knowledge base. We're going to be covering music, fashion, clubbing etiquette, dating, politics, scene drama, and paint a picture of the experience of being goth and hopefully provide a useful resource to share with anyone who's just getting interested in the scene. For those of you who aren't new, don't despair. This is Cemetery Confessions after all, so there is still a depth of thought here uh, that should be engaging, or at the very least, you can stick around to silently judge us uh, as is a favorite pastime for net goths. I'm also going to have a whole bunch of resources linked in the show notes, and that list will grow uh, over the next few months. I hope to continue adding for further reading and more in-depth analysis on music or artists. All of the things that are brought up on this show, we should have even more to explore and learn about. Um, so you can read those if you're on a podcast app. They should be in the app, although for the most up-to-date information, I would go to thebelfry.rip and then uh, look for Cemetery Confessions and read uh, uh, that episode entry. Speaking of our guests, we have Scary Lady Sarah from Chicago who runs a whole slew of events, probably most notably Nocturna, which has been running for 30 years or so, but also DJs and promotes a whole variety of shows and events, not just in Chicago, but around the world. We also have Nat and Nadia, two goths I discovered from TikTok, and I will have links to their content in the show notes as well. And of course, as always, I am the Count, and I am here with my co-host, Trey. So why don't we get to introductions? Of course, I would like to have you all share any websites, social media that you want uh, people to go check out. Um, but for uh, the beginning of the show, to get to know everybody, I'd like to ask, what was your introduction to goth? And I think maybe a little more specifically for this show, um, I wanted to kind of understand how you came to know, to find goth? What was that first moment like? And then what was it specifically about the music or the fashion or the community that resonated with you and wanted you to, made you want to get even more involved? Hello, um, my name is Sarah, but everybody in the entire world knows me as Scary Lady Sarah. It's my DJ name. And uh, I have been a professional club DJ doing goth nights since 1988. Um, how I came to be a goth, <laughs> I've never actually summed it up, I suppose, like that. But um, way back in the 80s, I was um, a huge part of the, the punk scene. Well, rather, the, the punk scene was a huge part of my life. Um, I was from, let's say, 1980 through 1986, uh, um, fully, fully entrenched in the hardcore punk scene in Chicago, going to shows um, at least once a week for the entirety of those years, so from the age of 13. And that kind of started because I 
was a really angry kid and I was, I was, you know, I guess you could say disaffected mm. and, and angry and had a lot of, a lot of rage at, at the world and just life circumstances. And when I found punk, which I found on the far left-hand side of the radio dial on college radio stations back then, um, I felt it resonate with me because it was expressing a lot of rage, primarily political rage. Um, but I, 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 I found it to be a, a tremendous outlet and ex ex expressing um, a lot of emotion that I felt as a young kid that I wasn't able to, to really put mm. into words. Mm. As I got a little bit older, um, I became less angry. <laughs> um, all that, all that outletting at shows, you know, and, and stage diving and being in the middle of a pit was, was mm -hmm. very, very healthy. And, um, I became more introspective and tried to work through my anger through art. And on those same radio stations that I found punk, I started hearing music that was a a little a little punk but a little different so i i remember the very first time i heard for example Bauhaus and Susie and the Banshees was when i was 12 so this is 1980 1980 i'm old <laughs> and um just through going through to record stores and finding the albums that i liked by the bands that i heard on these radio stations i started to see what the bands looked like on the pictures on the album covers of course, this is well before the internet, so that's what we did. Mm -hmm. And then I found fanzines and a few specific ones uh, from Chicago, local ones, that I found would cover not only the punk music, but New Romantic. And they didn't use the word goth yet, but bands like Susie and the Banshees. And that was just, a, it was very alluring to me, that their style, as well as the sound and the, the moodier of that music it wasn't just anger that was expressed it was a lot more and uh it, i delved into it further from there and here i am at <laughs> about to be 53 and never left <laughs> yeah. so. and uh so then where can we if we want to see what you're streaming what you got going on for your dj stuff where can we find that i on on pretty much all social media i am scary lady sarah um it's scary without an E because the word scary doesn't have an E, but a lot of people seem to think it does. <laughs> and Sarah with an, with an H at the end, S-A-R-A-H. And I on Twitch, my channel is twitch.tv slash scarylady.sarah. We do live stream versions of the club nights that we would normally be doing when there is not a pandemic. So we, we try and replicate those as much as possible for people at home until the clubs are safe to reopen. Facebook, Instagram, everywhere else you can think of pretty much it, it's it's if you look up scary lady sarah it's me <laughs> very cool all right uh naja what about you my name is naja and i'm now known as nagini on tiktok and instagram both of my parents had got me into goth um mm. my mom she would go to goth clubs she wasn't really like a like what she would say, it's a goth. She's more like a, um, I guess, a mall goth type. Mm -hmm. She would go clubbing and she would listen to Marilyn Manson. And we all know that Marilyn Manson isn't goth. But yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> she used to rock me to sleep to Marilyn Manson, actually. Oh, as a baby. that's adorable. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, my dad, my dad was the one that got me into the music. So when I was a kid, I would just... Um, see a bunch of um macabre stuff everywhere like my dad was into a lot of macabre and vampire stuff so he had like the bram stoker books he had vampire movies vampire books scary stuff all over the house we had a skull plant pot and then we had um blood stains on our window like people out in my school they would be like oh that's the crazy girl's house <laughs> we would keep it year round so like yeah yeah I, my both of my parents got me into it but um i was raised by um strict hindu catholic parents i was raised by my grandparents mm. so um it was very hard to 
be goth, even though both of my parents were into that. Um, I had to like hide it. And I also went to Catholic school, so I had to like um, hide that as well. Hide mm. my music taste. Yeah, like I got teased a lot for how I dressed and how um, how I acted and my music taste. I remember one time I had went to um, Hot Topic to listen to a band because at the time I didn't have a phone and there wasn't um, Apple Music or Spotify. Like you had to go to the store and listen to the music. So yeah. I went to go and listen to, um, I forgot what band it was. And then some guy came up to me and he was like, um, why are you listening to that? You're not supposed to be listening to that. You're supposed to be listening to rap. I mean, this is something that um, Pac deal with within the goth community and um, everyone else. Like, we have to deal with that. They always tell us, like, oh, why are you listening to that? That's not what you're supposed to listen to. Yeah, that's fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> High school is when I just didn't care and just started being more of myself and started dressing differently and um I tried to make goth friends but they weren't really goth they were more of on the emo side but they listened to goth music so that was like my click mm. but um college um it was I had to hide myself and um it was mainly because people they would i mean i had to live at the college so it was difficult to just be myself there because i have to you know hear it all the time if somebody's making fun of me like i have to deal with it all the time since i'm there in the dorm so yeah um, makes sense yeah <laughs> Uh, did you, other than your TikTok, was there anything else you wanted to uh, share for people to find you? Um, that's about it. My TikTok cool. and Instagram. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, thank you for coming on. Uh, and Nat, would you like to share a little bit about yourself? Yes. Okay. So, hi. My name is Nat. Uh, my Instagram handle is at Skeleton Keys, and as well as my TikTok is also at Skeleton Keys. Um, if you want me to start with the introduction, I can say something about that <laughs> um knock yourself out it's your um, time do it say whatever you want okay so um i grew up as a little queer jewish day uh kid and i went to a jewish day school uh, uh the class consisted of six people and me and this other girl were the only two alt people in the entire school it was a very small very tightly knit uh class but um we were both, we were both really just, we were, we were the only alt kids and it was really hard for us to branch out. And, but my parents were the ones who introduced me to, um, new wave. My mom was a new wave kid and my dad introduced me to, uh, Peter Murphy when I was like eight, nine, 10 years old. Um, so <laughs> there's a funny story when I was, I was, when I was like around that age, my dad was playing cuts you up in the car and I was like, dad, what's this song? And he's like, well, it's cuts you up by Peter Murphy. And I was like, can I see what he looks like? I don't, I don't know why I was so interested in his appearance, but my dad gave me his phone and I was like, wow, this is the most attractive man I have ever seen in my entire <laughs> life. Like legitimately, I think that was like the beginning. That was like the, br the blueprint of my love for like the beautiful like cheekbones and the height in the tall you know you know what i'm saying i was gonna say i'm still i'm still convinced the title cuts you up is a reference to his cheekbones but yeah honestly <laughs> yes that's what i'm saying exactly but i feel like so when i started getting into goth it wasn't really through the actual goth music but it was more through uh new like the like it was more through like new romantic. Like I was really into boy George. My, my mom raised me on boy George, David Bowie and Grace Jones. And it wasn't, it wasn't really the goth, the goth music. But as soon as I entered uh, like ninth, 10th grade, I remember seeing a uh, makeup tutorial and it had the sisters of mercy playing in the background. And I was like, oh, what 
is this? <laughs> and so I was so enthralled. I was so enamored. So I, I looked it up and I was like, this is the best band I've ever heard in my entire life. So I showed my mom and my mom was just like, yeah, this, this is, you know, this is, this is, wasn't what I listened to in high school, but go ahead. You can, you can try out, try it out. So I was like, cool. This is so awesome. So I was like a little nerd. I was geeking out in high school. So that introduced me to a lot of other cool and amazing bands, uh, you know, the entry level stuff as well. But as I grow older, I uh, got into a lot of the, uh, a lot of newer artists. Like I'm very much into Drab Majesty. That's not really a goth band, but I mean, you, you know, they say they're not goth. So it's like, well, you're just <laughs> so like yes, any other are. goth. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yes, you are. <laughs> but yes, um, that is my origin story. <laughs> Man, y'all's parents, I, my my parents just listen to contemporary Christian music. I feel cheated. That's, a, that's fantastic. <laughs> well, you got to be raised somewhere, you know? <laughs> yeah, I guess. Cool. Well, so everybody basically brought up music. So I think that's a great place to start. And uh, because personally, I think that is where it all started. And that's uh, what kind of ties it all together. So I want to kick it off with that and ask, you know, this kind of perennial question about how important is music to goth and you know is goth a music subculture and and why is that important to you let me let me just <laughs> there's a lot to be said about this honestly um i yeah. feel like the, there's a giant there's always some sort of giant debate uh, no matter how many times you like encounter it in the in the subculture there's always one person that will be like uh -huh. goth isn't music based what are you talking about and it's it's really hard to explain it to people who are newer because whenever they think goth they think well here there's usually a couple like instances where people think the architecture or the yeah. fashion but when 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 you talk to anyone who's been in the subculture for so long you know that goth is heavily music based and i feel like as it sort of evolved and it's always people are like well the subculture is always evolving there's there's no however there's no way to avoid the music there really mm. isn't the music is a huge important aspect of the subculture as a whole and i say this a lot to my followers who are trying trying to get into it that they uh as much as they want to hop into the fashion or hop into any other aspect of goth like the aesthetics <laughs> or like you know i always say hey so a really, really good place to start is, so I send them a Spotify playlist that I made. Mm, for, mm -hmm. that is for people who don't have Spotify, I usually come up with a little list of songs or lists of bands that they can listen to. But sometimes people don't like the music and that's perfectly okay. You know, um, it's there are many, many different subgenres. So I think it's really good to just introduce people to things that they might like because also to me it sounds different like dark wave and post-punk sound completely different and to me mm -hmm. I'm just I'm just gonna say it straight up I prefer dark wave <laughs> over post-punk like I'm not I'm not even joking but sometimes people don't like certain artists like I was never really a fan of Nick Cave Ooh, am I gonna get my goth card revoked uh, you know? where's the hang up button <laughs> hang on where no! okay see ya. <laughs> no. but um yeah there's it's okay like it's perfectly it okay is. um mm -hmm. I know, I know a lot of people who are into Joy Division. They see it as sort of like a like an entry level thing, and you know their whole their whole like no, it I don't like it because it's so over overplayed. It's so overdone. One but of I, them I, is I on this call. I won't. Uh oh, say who they are, but... <laughs> and yet again, that's perfectly okay. Like it's really it's really impossible to like the, again the music is impossible to avoid. But at the same time, it's okay if you prefer one thing over the other. Like that's the beauty of, of music is that we all have different opinions and we all have different like ways we can listen. I don't know. I think it's pretty cool. Yeah. Right. With uh, kind of jumping on that, it doesn't, to, to be a goth doesn't mean you have to like every single goth band, but if you right. don't like any goth music, you're mm -hmm. not a goth. I'm yeah. just, sorry. You're just not, yeah. you know, you, you might like, I don't know, to wear black or something, but it's, so what? Lots of people wear black. Darkly um, inclined. Yeah, I guess that's the term <laughs> yeah. that it's used. Um, I, I will say, too, I'm going to interject, I feel very out of touch with y'all. <laughs> I'm going to ask you some questions. Just because, you know, I, everyone's talking about, like, cell phones and their parents, and it's like, yeah, that's 100% that's, that's not my experience. So yeah. it's, 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 it's interesting, <laughs> but um, I'm having a hard time connecting so I, I will do my best to 
give my opinions and, and I think, advice if it's asked. But yeah, no, I think that's okay though because I, in my own life, I've known people who got into goth when they were fourteen, and I've known people who have got into goth when they were fifty. Yeah, um, yeah. and I so think, that's I why. God. Yeah, I'd say more than maybe the age. It's it's kind of the year too because our world is not the world. If you got into goth now when you're 14 or if you got into goth today right. and you're 50 is absolutely not getting into goth in 1982. And I don't mean it was better, but it was absolutely fundamentally different. Yeah. Absolutely. Subcult subcult subculture was different. How you found it, how you experienced it was different. What it what it meant was different. So, um I can you know, I, I I engage with a lot of younger people. My my biggest club night is 18 plus. So I meet a lot of you know, 18 to 25 year olds. I, I don't know, actually know how old the other people that I'm speaking to tonight are, but um, there's, there's less and less, you know, people of my generation that, that are still involved in goth. Um, so I, I kind of know what younger goths are into, but it's, it's, it's very, very different. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. It, it is, yeah get that Sarah I'm only about nine ten years younger than you so I'm, I'm in my 40s and got into it in the 90s so not quite the same as the 80s but closer I think than today because there was still more work to get into music there wasn't online resources there wasn't streaming you had to go to stores you had to know people you had to get lists or mixtapes you had to walk uphill um, both ways yeah. <laughs> Mo most yes I say even more than that those things absolutely but I think more than that was just how um being goth was looked at. It wasn't, um, it wasn't dissected or, mm -hmm. or analyzed. And it wasn't a lot of the things that, that people do now. It just, it just, honestly, it just was, people were just part of, part of this scene, but, but had to, had to engage in it to be part of it. You know, otherwise you were just someone who likes goth music, which is also fine. Yeah. Um, but we have, we have a very different world now. So it, a lot of that stuff doesn't really apply. Like my experiences are no one, I'd say no one under at least 40 could, <laughs> or maybe even 45 um, can kind of, yeah. The internet changed everything. So it's yes. very true. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. What you just mentioned, Sarah, I was kind of thinking about that when for, um, we don't have to go in order, but for talking about like identity um, and I was thinking about how in the 80s and, and well, especially in the 80s, I, th I feel like what people were trying to do was create something new, something revolutionary, something that was like a uh, extension of an artistic passion. And then what we had somewhere in the late 90s, I feel like was more of a focus on um, how do we kind of take what's been made and then live in that space, but make it more goth. And then from there forward, there I feel like there's always been an emphasis to some degree on having a label and understanding what that label means. And right. for goths in the 80s, that's kind of anathema to what they were doing because they weren't trying to codify something and, and erect guidelines for something. They were just creating a new sound and a new culture and seeing where it went. Yeah. And But now you can't really get away from that discourse, that question of like, Absolutely. What is goth is always is just going to be there whether you like it or not. And I think what yeah. happened is that kind of goes back to what you were saying, Nat, is now you have these people who, for all intents and purposes, are goth, but will completely deny that they're goth because they don't want anything to do with it. Yeah. And because they don't like having that uh, being defined. Now, I do I do feel like, though, we have less of a focus on that recently especially with the music because we kind of after we had the death rock revival in like 2003 2004 i think a lot of people said uh well that was kind of shit um let's try and let's go back to like trying to make something that's unique and creative rather than trying to do something that's already been done and i think a lot of new music now is doing that um but to some degree though that aspect of having boundaries and having labels even if they're kind of flexible even if they're permeable and change over time that's always going to be there and so that's i mean if you don't enjoy it if you don't like that that's fine you don't have to be goth but like i feel like that's just kind of part of what it is now and that's absolutely yeah 100 yeah. mm -hmm. percent. 
um, you know, you were saying, you know, the, the argument's always going to be there. Um, I have people on my Facebook, uh, there was a recent post that um, someone was saying, I just don't understand how you can claim to call yourself goth when the meat, when uh, you can't even like listen to, like you can't even simply look at even the surface level stuff and really like look into it and research it. And I found this to be quite interesting because this post received a, received a lot of backlash. And I think there are different ways of approaching people who are new to the subculture. I don't think degrading or demeaning them is any good way because when I, when I usually meet like a quote unquote baby bat or someone who is just kind of starting getting into alt, I always like let them know that it's okay to feel like you're kind of lost at first, but also at the same time, you know, it's, it's good to like be slow a little bit, get it, get into it, Mm -hmm. get going to go into the flow of things. So I think, uh, definitely instead of like like slandering their name you could like send them like different things that you like send them different bands uh it's there are a lot of nicer ways to approach people and then that comes to the point of elitism where people are just like uh you you there's there's i feel like the word elitism and gatekeeping is really thrown around and yeah. i feel like i feel like it absolutely uh, gatekeeping they're like i feel like there there's good kinds of gatekeeping and then there are bad kinds of gatekeeping and i was explaining that also in a video uh i didn't i don't mean to talk too much but this is like a topic that i really really enjoy talking about um but gatekeeping is good and necessary when you're trying to keep not so nice people out of the subculture for instance racists or uh people who are homophobic or transphobic or xenophobic anything of that sort I don't I don't think I think also that sort of like I feel like you can't really call yourself like any of those things and goth at the same time because you're sort of rejecting that uh you're sort of rejecting that non-conformist sort of uh je- like you're, you're you're rejecting the origins to me that that's at least what I what I believe yeah. that's, the, that's I have such a hard time um understanding why there are apparently some people who call themselves goth and are racist for example because back in my day and i hate to sound like the old (laughs) (laughs) but being being goth intrinsically meant you were none of those things it was it was with this unsaid but accepted and absolutely known without any question that you that you did not have those properties. Um, it wouldn't be have been accepted um, by people, and it, it, it was it would be like absolutely the most hypocritical thing. So it just it didn't exist. And now when I hear about that, I'm I mean I, I feel a little shocked um, and saddened of course that there are people who um try and claim goth but also are whatever racist or homophobic or transphobic etc yeah it's it's baffling absolutely baffles me to this day and i I try not to you know let myself be (laughs) stymied by by, (laughs) this this new world but um yeah it's it's really weird i have a i do have a theory about that but i want to hear let's keep going on this train since we're here uh talking about the political aspect of of yes. goth culture who who else wants to jump in on that i'm um i think it's really interesting there was a i don't know nausea i think you <clears throat> i think you remember this there okay so i i don't know if you guys are on tiktok all that much much but me and nausea are. i am yeah <laughs> i found <laughs> both of you on tiktok actually first i, just, so. I have there an account go. but of course <laughs> well if you follow the goth hashtag or if you're on the goth side of tiktok quote unquote um <laughs> there is a giant humongous debate on whether goth is a political subculture or not sorry and uh nausea you can jump in at any time because i probably don't have a lot of information on this because i i try to like i i kind of it's so i originally um i said to be honest i believe that um goth versus politics has always been a huge thing and i believe that uh especially in the origins, you know, like what you said, uh, Sarah, I said, I think it's like interesting when people say 
well, you can be goth and conservative because it's just a music based subculture. Yeah. You can't, you can't like mu- yeah. if it's just, if it's just about music, then exactly. you, you can't. Yeah. And it's just like, well, uh, hmm. <laughs> it's like, well, you know, you're thinking about artists that rejected gender roles. You're thinking artists who uh, were progressive for their times, who were, mm-hmm. were, um, who were, they were so ahead of ahead of their time that you know it's really, really impossible to say goth is not political because, like, when I see when I meet any goth, I typically see them. Uh, they're typically left wing, at least from any of the other mm-hmm. goths that I've met before. Um, yeah. And it's just really interesting when I hear someone say, I'm conservative in goth because goth is just music based. There's nothing else to it. And I'm like, whoa, whoa there, yeah. buddy. Slow they down don't a little it. bit. Yeah. <laughs> they do not get it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Naja, well, here, let's, let's, Naja, did you want to say anything before Trey jumps in? Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I just think they need to educate themselves on what it really stands for. Like, I've seen somebody that said, God's for Trump. And I was like, what is that? <laughs> yeah. Yes. That's, that's bullshit. It's what that is. <laughs> God's for Trump. That makes me laugh. <laughs> so as far as the uh, whole political thing, I mean, I've, I've expressed my views on it fairly frequently on this show. But I think, I'm not sure, and I'm just sort of spitballing on this, but I almost want to say the the people who protest the most stridently saying goth isn't a political thing, it's purely musical. I want to say that I, I want to bet that they're mostly American. Oh, I absolutely. I think 100%. our country has a very, very, I guess, pejorative view of the concept of political. Po- politics has become so poisoned in this country that so many people are trying to escape from it and and try to push everything away and they get all pissed off when politics gets into their sports or into their music or into their movies and TV shows, the things they consider their their escape, their release from the worries of every day. And I mean, it's not just in goth. I mean, there's plenty of people in the goth scene who want to use it just as a release and don't want it to have any voice about the turmoils of the day and, and our, our political wrangling and all of that. But it's infected a lot of other scenes too. The most fascinating one I saw was people who are big fans of rage against the machine getting all up in arms when rage against the machine outside of their music started speaking up about black lives matter or things like that. They've and people are treating like political. And people treating to them like, Oh my God, I can't believe this band got political. I'm, oh I'm going to stop gosh. listening to them. And then, <laughs> <They've always been laughs> Did political. they listen to their lyrics? <laughs> I know. And I don't know if it was Zach or, or the, or someone else on the band, but they posted with, can you tell me which songs you were listening to that weren't political so I can delete them from our discography? <laughs> because <laughs> our entire discography is political. It's the entire purpose of our being. But I think so many people around their forms of entertainment just have this very superficial view of it. They just It's, it's this sort of mindless release. They're not really engaging with this content. It's just a sound and a feeling and these abstract things. And that's what they key on, and they're not hearing those messages. And so when those messages creep in, if they're messages that make them uncomfortable, they really reject it and reject it violently. Um, I'm a part of, so I'm a really big uh, fan of the band uh, Skinny Puppy. It's like mm-hmm. my favorite band of all time. And Good I'm choice. on, a, I'm like, yes, <laughs> I'm on a Facebook group uh, for Skinny Puppy. It's the official group. And I remember when, um, um, there was this one post that someone made about uh, Black Lives Matter. And a lot of people were up in arms about it. And it was really interesting because the vocalist for Snee Puppy, Navek Ogre, um, I, don't, I don't think he's spoken upon specifically Black Lives Matter. But if I had to guess, he would be an advocate because he yeah. makes music <laughs> for for the for this sort of subject. He speaks against fascism. He speaks against uh, he speaks against all sorts of uh, terrible corruption that happens in today's society. And I, I don't see why you could be a, a fan of Skinny Puppy and completely be like, oh yeah, it's just it's just the it's just the noise. It's just go woo 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 woo. You know, yeah. it's like well, how can you how can you like not see 
uh, how can you not listen to the lyrics and think this is this is not about equality this is just about the funny noises and Nivek Ogre growling into the microphone like what you know what I mean yeah I read that same experience with uh, the band ministry I was oh, DJing what? at a release party for their the book about them just a couple months back and, <laughs> and someone I met there added me on Facebook and all he does all day long is post pro-Trump memes and oh, industrial oh music God. videos. So I finally wrote to him. I'm like, you know all those bands that you're posting the videos of? They would all hate every you. single political thing yeah, that you are <laughs> posting. Do you realize that? No, I just like, you know, I just like. The yeah, music. Uncle L's yeah. not down with that. Yeah, yeah. no, especially because yeah. industrial. The, uh, this is, I mean. I feel like industrial is one of my favorite genres and I, a lot of people say it's not goth, but I don't really care because it's a really important <laughs> part of myself. But uh, the music is highly uh, shaped around queer trans artists, queer and trans artists. So it's really interesting when you meet a transphobic industrial fan, it's like, mm. where were you these like past years? It's like yeah. Genesis P. Orridge is like yelling at you right now. Like what the <laughs> heck? There is, I mean, so just to touch on the industrial thing real quick, there there is a really complicated history with industrial and misogyny. And um, we did an entire episode on that, actually, with uh, – we had Andy Harriman on. We had uh, Alex Reed, the author of Assimilate, on. And uh, we talked about um, – all that kind of sexist stuff that it exists within misogyny. So I'll link that in the article. And I, I don't actually, I don't think I, in the article, in the show notes, I don't think I mentioned this. I'm going to have a bunch of further reading resources on this episode that I'll keep updating into the future uh, to try and make it a good like resource for people to check out as it's the kind of the theme of the, the episode. But I think I could probably say a couple things to fill in on the political side of stuff uh, around what y'all said. Um, uh, it, like Trey also mentioned, the last, I think, three episodes we've done, this topic has come up. So we've tackled it from a few different angles. And then the next episode we're doing, we're going to be interviewing a sitting uh, House representative that is also a goth. And so that's definitely going to come up again. But yeah, a couple little things that I usually mention around this issue is, you know, from the beginning, not just the music, but Goth share, goths shared subcultural spaces with queer and deviant communities because we didn't have our own spaces. And those communities are also, they're inherently political because they're fighting for their right to exist. Obviously, somebody mentioned gender bending being related to goth. That's, you know, ideologically feminist and political. Um, anyone who's ever said that goth is countercultural or talked about goth combating um, or I guess kind of subverting uh, power dynamics, like transgressing cultural norms, those all have left-leaning underpinnings and are political statements. And then, you know, if you look at um, the way music is released and the kind of, even from the beginning, the sort of democratization of publishing music, and, and if you read interviews with or talk to label heads, um, like a uh, uh, Chicago reference, uh, Desmond of Occult Whispers, um, but like Obscura Undead, we have a technical, they've been doing releases. But any of these uh, manic depression, you you see what they're doing. They're, they aren't running these platforms for profit. They're primarily doing it to benefit the art and the community. And that itself is a subversion of like, capitalist ideals, which is also political. So there's no real way of getting away from this. As far as, um, uh, I, I don't remember exactly what you said, Sarah, but I have kind of a theory as to why this is even a topic right now. And I don't know, you y'all can tell me what you think about it, but I think that somewhere in the 2000s, the early 2000s was when I got into the scene. Um, from my experience, goth seemed to have become more associated with a lifestyle and a collection of stuff. It seemed like the uh, uh, lessening of the importance of uh, political activism was because alternative appearances and uh, that kind of thing became more acceptable and there was less. And so because we weren't being actively targeted, people kind of stopped caring. Because so like in the 80s, there 
from what I've read, at least there were and heard actually in previous interviews, there were pockets of pushes from neo-Nazi groups to try and infiltrate subcultural spaces. So we had to actively fight that. But it seems like around the 2000s, that was less of a thing. And so the older goths that were introducing newer goths to the scene didn't seem to really emphasize the impact or importance of social identities and and the importance of activism. And um, that's what we kind of had was this like drip of bands like Death in June being allowed to be normalized of having a presence in the goth scene. And we had that other thing that Nat said about this argument that, you know, well, goth is just about music or goth is about music and how you dress. And we weren't talking about how our behaviors and our the way we think and the kind of philosophical underpinnings of the music and the fashion why that is political and why that is transgressive. And so a lot of people I know that got into the scene in the 2000s led to this kind of thinking of goth isn't really left leaning. It's just this neutral space where you can have whatever, you can debate whatever. Um, So I, I am really happy to hear everybody here talk about how like, goth isn't a debate club and if you're gonna if you're gonna share rhetoric about that that denies the agency and the identity of people that are marginalized that that's we're not gonna let you in our spaces and i think that's really important all right cool so well let's let's go back to talking about music a little bit trey did you did you have anything you wanted to share on why music is important to goth where you know people can that are new to the scene can get started that kind of thing well, I guess the only thing I would want to share about that, I mean, I've already discussed what I feel about the importance of music in goth and the diversity of music in goth, which is one thing I've really hit on a lot, especially when people are saying, well, I don't like goth music. Um, the follow-up question should always be, well, what goth music have you listened to? Because there's a lot there and there's a lot of variety there. And as has already been mentioned, I think by Nat, there, there are plenty of people who don't like certain goth bands and that's fine. There's a lot yeah. of different sounds and not everyone's going to like every single one of those sounds. Um, so a new person coming in, if they've only heard goth rock or only heard death rock or only heard, you know, a sliver of the goth umbrella of music, then having them listen to a wide variety of things, is, I think an important way for them to engage with that aspect of the community. Um, but I think anytime you're trying to introduce somebody to the scene or it usually happens is somebody is, you know, not necessarily interested in joining the scene, but is curious what their friend is into. If you if you are their goth friend and they're like, well, you know, I want to understand what you're into. You kind of have to start with what they like and kind of move from there. So find out the person who's seeking more information. What kind of music do they like and what do they like about it? And then use that to recommend, oh, here are goth bands that are like that or dealing with similar topics or have similar sounds or similar feels. So if you really want to be a goth ambassador to get other people into music, you kind of have to know a lot about music outside of goth, too. I think if you only listen to goth music, it's going to be a lot harder to bring someone else in because you're just embedded in this world and you don't have a point of reference that Mm. you can use to hook another person in and introduce them. So I think that's probably an important trait for someone who actively wants to be an ambassador for the music. Um, And other things could be just a good resource of, hey, here's a list of a bunch of goth bands or goth songs that are exemplifying all the different styles and sounds. Um, Having a resource like that would be probably the best response to, you know, the anonymous forum posts or Reddit threads or whatever where someone's curious about it or saying they don't like it. Um, Have something like that that you can just have in your pocket and throw out there like, here's the variety that I know of. Try some of it. See if you like any of it and and move from there. So uh, anyone else want to say anything about that? Because I don't want to dominate the conversation. I agree, though. Um, I think an important way to approach people who are not familiar with the scene is to literally give them, instead of like, I feel like a lot of the reasons why a lot of people won't join uh, the goth subcultures because their fear of elitism and fear of gatekeeping. And I feel like a really good way to approach people is to just gently give them music suggestions. Like for instance, my friend, uh, is, uh, she 
doesn't know a lot about goth music, but she grew up around a lot of punk and she grew up a lot of, a lot, uh, around a lot of alternative. So I give her a lot of uh, surface level stuff to begin with because I think it's good to uh, develop a sort of baseline if unless like she if she's not into it I mean that's perfectly okay like I can give her a, a lot of different other artists as well but I'll give her artists like okay so if you like punk have you ever heard of post-punk have you ever heard of I mean you probably listened to The Cure before I mean if you've listened to The Cure before you'll you'll like a lot of the other artists that stemmed from the goth subculture as well so I think it really is, is nice to just treat people gently and just give them a, a list and just suggest music instead of being like Hmm. Well, and being like kind of like a, a snob about it, I guess. Mm -hmm. Does anyone want to share specific bands you might uh, suggest to someone who's getting who's who's interested in checking out the music? I have a whole list, but I don't want to take up the conversation. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I think, again, I think I, I, I might approach this from a slightly different angle. Please. Um, that I'm, I'm not I, I often joke. Like I say, goths, we recruit, but I, <laughs> but I, I kind of, I don't exactly believe that in a way too. Um, I mean, I'm, I want there to be always to be goths because, uh, it's nice to have a community. Um, at the same time, I feel like if you really feel that that's what you are and that's the kind of music you like and stuff, it doesn't matter if you're the only one in your entire city or if there's 10,000 of you in, in, in the same city. Um, I think if somebody is drawn to this subculture again I'm, it, it, I'm trying to kind of relate to the the way people are drawn to it nowadays but it's 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 just not something I'm super familiar with um, even though my whole you know, career is, is in the goth scene um, and it's my it's not my only part of my identity but it's it's a pretty major one mm. um, I think if people are drawn to it and they ask me, but I, I, you know, what should I listen to? I, I'd be happy to give them suggestions of, you know, the classic bands and some current stuff, and the variety. Like we were, a couple of you were saying earlier, is is the to me one of the best things about goth music, is the variety of, mm -hmm. of sounds mm -hmm. and styles within that fall under that goth umbrella. But um, I'm not, and as I definitely don't keep bands secret, I I make a point of of letting everybody who who listen or read know the, like, what bands I play it when I DJ um, and I share music a lot, but I, I don't know. It just feels like it's, um, it, well, that, it's, I mean, it's more, it's, it, it, it means something more. I think if someone finds mm, this stuff on their mm -hmm. own, you mm -hmm. know, it's kind of a two, two edged sword because I mean, my experience was very, was similar to that. in in that, uh, when I, discovered what goth was i very much wanted to it was kind of an all-consuming thing and i i wanted to i was always looking for stuff it was a little well it was a lot harder because i couldn't just google you know for bands and stuff um i did though have and it was harder for me because i grew up in a very uh, closed off sort of christian community so it was really hard to connect with people and i did have one or two experiences where I met goths and I was trying to get information of like, hey, what, you know, recommend me some bands because I have a very hard time finding anything if I can only go to the Christian music store to look for stuff. You know, what, like, what can I torrent? What can I whatever? And uh, occasionally people would be like, ah, you know, figure it out yourself. Like, I'm not going to tell you all our secrets kind of stuff. And that was, that was hard for me as a kid because I was really trying to get involved and I felt like people were telling me I wasn't cool enough to already be involved in a way. Um, but yeah, so today though, like I, f I feel like the question, it, it seems pretty uh, accepted now that music is part of the subculture. That seems like it's less of a debate. And I think, I think that's kind of driven by the sheer number of bands that we have and the diversity. Whereas in years past, there has been a drop off in either quality of music or just a complete lack of bands where you had like five bands playing, uh, basically being the sisters of mercy. And that was about it. Oh my gosh. Uh, oh, <laughs> so it's, it's amazing that we have choice now. And I did want to kind of talk about the, I want well, I wanted to kind of use the argument of 
because I've seen this recently in Facebook groups that goth is more of a dark romantic Victorian subculture and not necessarily music as a jumping off point to talk about the diversity of goth music. And this actually, I reread um, Jillian Venter's, uh, what was her book? Um, I have it somewhere. Oh, uh, Gothic Charm School. Gothic Charm School, yeah. Um, and she kind of, yeah, I reread it in prep for this show and she kind of makes a similar argument in there about goth being older than music as far as Victorian stuff and Edgar Allan Poe and that kind of thing. First, The first thing to understand is that the range of historical influences that goth draws on is broader than Victorian literature. So I absolutely, well, yeah. before I get to some examples, like, first of all, I think the most important thing is that, uh, the term goth wasn't even really applied to a group of people until the late eighties anyway. And it was really that explosion in the eighties of the art and the music that brought everything together. Yeah. So you don't, you don't have that before, you know, I don't know if you want to say 79, whatever it is, whatever arbitrary year you want to say, but you don't have that in the 1800s. Right. So you, and you had stuff from all over the world. It was, I know everybody talks about the UK bands and that was really important, but you had, um, early Spanish bands in the eighties, in the early eighties, like paralysis permiente. You had, uh, bands in Japan, like Fadia, um, Germany, obviously every, there was a whole dark electronic post-punk movement there. Um, I think malaria was, is probably one of my favorite from that era that really combines the industrial electronic scene with the, uh, uh weird post-punk avant-garde stuff. You had death rock in the U S right? We can't forget about that. Christian death, superheroines, that kind of stuff. So you had this uh, conversion of dark artistic expression all over the world. And um, it wasn't, it wasn't just Victorian stuff like Bauhaus used Jamaican dub in their songs. Um, Susie took fashion inspiration from Kabuki theater. Um you know, everybody knows the kind of German expressionism was part of that with Bauhaus's cover art and that kind of thing. And actually album art, I, I think Sarah brought this up, but it seems like that's less relevant today. But that kind of thing was still important because it, oh, yeah. it was part of creating something, right? It, it rolls all up into, you know, people talk about the Batcave, they immediately talk about the decor, but that album artwork was part of that. Um, and I pulled a, f uh, just so I had some, I pulled a few examples. There were like albums, people were using Roman art, psychedelia, Andy Warhol, Celtic symbology. Um, there was a sex gang children album that used, uh, the shrines in Sri Lanka. Um, you had, um, um, actually, and, uh, Andy sex gang talked about in, um, what was that book? Uh, in the preface to Art of Gothic, he talked about Dadaism and how that as a philosophy was important to his music. Um, but you had, and f as for philosophy, like existentialist and absurdist philosophy, that was important. Like Nick Cave was brought up, Fields of the, ne of the Nephilim was the more occultic kind of stuff. Faith in the Muse, you took inspiration from uh, Japanese and Shinto culture. You had Hammer Horror and just like the 80s, I was when I was reading the first chapter of Phantoms, 45 Grave talks a lot about how influential Hammer Horror and monster films were. Glam Rock and the New Romantics, Nat, I think you brought that up. Um, what, and, and actually that's an influence on Drab Majesty as well. I love like, Drab Majesty. I used to today, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Drab Majesty so much. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. Yeah, they're great. I love that. Uh, yeah. What else did I? Oh, I had a couple more examples. So, like Cocteau Twins, they yes. you they had influence from scatting, which is vocal jazz, right? So that's yep. another <laughs> out there influence. There's um, a giant joke about Cocteau Twins. How it's like, what the heck are what the heck is she saying? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what plane of the demonic realm did did you just channel? She um, sounds like she's speaking light language. It's beautiful. <laughs> But yeah, so and I mean, all that to say is basically just to say, if you're getting into goth, goth music is critical. It's the foundation. It's the thing that ties everything else together. And um, that's a good place to start. As far as recommendations, because I did write down a few bands. I, well, and I, we do band recommendations every episode. So I wanted to try and pick stuff that um, I've been listening to recently. So a few bands that I've been really enjoying are Secret Shame, uh, 
Paris, uh, how do you say this? Parasomnia. It's a Peruvian band. Bastet, I really love. Otzi, I've been listening to a lot of love Otzi. Tumbas. Yeah. Um, Geometric Vision is like a more new wavy kind of thing. And uh, and then I've been getting into Tears for the Dying, which is a new uh, death rock band. I think, yeah, so I, I guess the only other thing we can really, uh, I could really ask as far as music is concerned is, uh, I know I know my answer, I know Sarah's answer, but I'm interested to hear if you all think that the old 80s and 90s stuff is still relevant. Like, would you tell people to listen to that? Yes, yes. of course. Okay. Yes. Okay. I never know. I never know if that still makes sense and connects with people today, you know. That's actually the first thing I typically recommend to people. And I say, so <laughs> it's really impossible to just listen to all of the goth bands that exist on planet Earth as of right now. But a really good way to start is to go way back. It's like take a take a little trip back to when it actually began. And can that because that kind of serves as a foundation and I feel like uh, a lot of the newer artists were greatly, heavily inspired around uh, artists that were popular back then. Um, well, we were talking about how, uh, I hate to bring it back to politics, but a lot of the, there's a big topic on uh, TikTok about the origins, the real origins of goth music. And a lot of people believe, and I actually believe this is 100% true, that it originated off Screaming Jay Hawkins uh, and his aesthetic and his performance and his... Uh, style of music um it's a lot it's it's uh either, you know the song i put a spell on you it's like it's like that i feel like peter murphy was highly influenced off of screaming jay hawkins and i think uh i, I think it's really interesting when people are like well what where did it really begin because i don't think there's really any true way to be like where did the goth subculture and where did the music actually start yeah. you know what i mean there's a really I, I know I keep recommending books, but in um, Leela Taylor, I had her on the show before she wrote the book Darkly. Uh, was it Darkly Black History and America's Gothic Soul? Yeah. She has a really interesting section in there about Screaming Jay Hawkins and about her feelings. Um, the book is basically her talking about her experience as a black goth and, and in, in life in general. But she she brings up the complexity of that song. Um, I, you should all go check it out. I don't want to like butcher her what she's trying to say but she brings up the complexity of that song because there's some um uh, some people think that uh the the way that song was presented with him as like the kind of you know the bone through the nose and that stuff and the kind of black magic thing was a push from the producers to make it more performative for white listeners and she said she doesn't know if that's actually true or not but it's a complicated uh thing to to look at and try and, and see how foundational and um, uh, uh, creative and incredible that song is, but also the the stereotypes that still exist around black people and the way that they they perform. So it's uh, it was really interesting to read that because there's I haven't seen a lot of uh, critical analysis of that song. So anyway, that's a book I would recommend. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, I was going to mention somebody mentioned online something that really stuck with me the other day that we now in 2020 are as far away from the 80s as we were from the 40s in the 80s and Ooh. that struck me so hard because i feel like i'm you know i'm I've a, i'm a product of, of the 80s as far yeah. as my you know my adult life um you know, i was born in the 60s but and in the 80s, I didn't look back to the 40s really for inspiration for the subculture I was living in the 80s. You know, I didn't right. look back to the 40s for like or the what the bands were. <laughs> or the, I, I liked and I still appreciate, I guess, the, the style, some of the some of the fashion and whatnot. But I didn't bring it into and it, it's very um, it's interesting and very different that people do that now, like for for the sounds. Because even though we have such a great variety of, of bands within the goth scene, um, this nice, you know, like I hate the word revival, but um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this nice resurgence <laughs> mm. of, of, of styles um, 
and we have less and less bands that just want to sound like bands from the 80s but still there are some and i just, yeah. just very curious why because there weren't bands in the 80s that were trying to sound like bands from the 40s. From the 40s, <laughs> yeah. right. I think it'd be really interesting, though. I think it'd be really cool if somehow we were able to come, like, find, somehow uncover a band that did try to sound like something from the yeah. 40s. I think that'd be really interesting. interesting. We, we played a... We, we... We played with that in the 90s a bit with the swing revival and some of the big band revival stuff that was happening there. So we definitely have had (laughs) periods where we've done that. And then, you know, even the bands in the 80s, the the early goth and industrial bands did take some inspiration from bands. Well, not bands, artists back then, but they were mostly in the academic spheres and the avant-garde classical spheres um, and some of the sound experiments with early recording and sampling technologies and, and whatnot. But that's not stuff that really gets talked about unless you really dig into, you know, like a list of, you know, what did Genesis Purge really like? Music his, archivist his, his, kind his of history. stuff. Yeah, yeah, some of those real music geeks from back then, what, yeah. they, what were they listening to and what were their inspirations? But it wasn't a sense that, that it was pop music from that era or... Or, or other recorded music that's commonly available. It was getting into the sort of weird artistic expressionistic stuff. Um, heck, even going back to the turn of the century with some of the old brutalist uh, sound experiments with cannons and washing machines and propellers being in musical instruments in an orchestral piece. Mm. Yeah. It's fun. I was in middle school in the 90s and I took a uh, few years of... Uh, swing dance classes which i hated but a uh, little fact for you uh cool so, <laughs> well, uh, so well i hated it i didn't like it at all <laughs> uh so sarah brought up fashion so maybe we can uh talk a bit about fashion and then jump into kind of the club scene and and friend you know social circles that kind of stuff so as far as clothing and fashion goes i guess we can just do you know what are your what are your where to look how to do it how to not look like, you know, the crow, uh, DIY tips, that kind of stuff. What do you guys got? I love the crow. I, I, I'd, I'd, li- I'd like to look like the crow. <laughs> yeah, I'll just start with that. It's okay so... to look like the crow. Do it. See, now I feel it, old because it. that's that was a big no-no. That was taboo. Don't Because you had eight different people with shitty clown paint, you know, <laughs> at the goth club that looked like bro. And it was like, God, please stop. Please, please don't. It is. Please, yeah. hold back. But you got you to gotta stop. So, you got to start somewhere. Yeah, we yeah. had a lot of a lot of crows at Nocturne over the years, <laughs> <laughs> which is fine. <laughs> yeah, like Trey said, you got to start somewhere. Um, as far as like style and wardrobe and clothing, I have always, I mean, since forever, literally since I was, you know, since the 80s, um, purchased 90% of what I wear at thrift stores. Mm-hmm. Yep. Still do. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It's just, it's nice to find something that you have a less likely chance of someone else wearing the same thing when you're out. Um, it's it's easy to to customize things. I think that a little bit more when you have something that's different. It's cheaper. <laughs> it's better for the ecology of the planet, you know, mm-hmm. to recycle and reuse yeah. clothing. Um, and every once in a great while, I will find something maybe on you know a, a goth clothing website. Etsy has a um, gosh, an amazing amount of, of gothy designers um, that are not huge companies. I don't know, but I think I, yeah. I probably have a pair of boots from one of the big ones, you know, like the Killstar, but that's about it. Yeah. But that's, Demonia. you know, I, yeah, I'm not, yes. right. I'm, I'm like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna judge anybody for, for going to those resources if that's all they, they know or if that's all they can find. But mm-hmm. I think uh, thrift stores are the way to go. Absolutely. There used to, yeah. There used to be goth stores. I don't, there's hardly any. Been, yeah. There's not any where I live. But. Yeah, Let's I not still get sad. Miss 99th floor. Oh, God. I do too. Yeah. There are, I mean, there are some exist in other places, like in um, LA. I think there's a couple, and uh, I'm sure there's some in Europe and whatever, but yeah, they're hard to come by now. Even less, though, than there were. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. Uh, Naja, you and I have probably received comments like this before on our videos. I want to be goth, but the clothing is so expensive. It's so, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so expensive, you know? And it's like, well, first of all, it shouldn't be in the first place to begin with. I mean, if you want to treat yourself once in a while, there's nothing wrong with that. But 
you know, if you really, if you really want to like get into the fashion, you know, like you were, what you were saying, uh, just thrift, thrift and mm-hmm. DIY. DIY is certainly, I think, a very important aspect in the community. I am very shitty at DIY, and I, but I do have a lot of uh, friends who are fashion design majors, and they help me out mm. in that aspect. So I guess I'm pretty privileged to say that, you know, I've got people to help me out in that area. But um, a lot of people actually don't enjoy thrifting because they can't find anything their size. And, um, because, and it's, it's really, um, I got a comment like that the other day and they're like, well, how do you find trad goth fashion if nothing is, nothing can fit you? And I'm, and I honestly don't know how to answer that question because I, I'd say again, I'm pretty privileged to, you know, not have that problem happen to me. Hmm. I guess I would, if someone said that to me, I'd probably want to take them thrift shopping with me because yeah. you're not looking, I don't know, to me anyway, I'm not looking for something that looks I don't know like 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 something I would find on a a yeah. quote unquote golf site is just if you yeah. know okay it's 99.99 well okay 100% of the time it's going to be black <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say 90 but who am I kidding my closet's entirely black um, <laughs> if it and if you if you make something your own even if you don't know how to sew I, I can't sew for or anything. Me neither. <laughs> no, yeah, but, but safety, safety, safety pins do great things, and so do mm-hmm. ribbon, ribbons, and scissors, and glue. Um, glue. There you go. <laughs> glue. Sure. Why not? Um, I just think I, I see, I think see things all the time. I'm like, oh, I wish this was my size, and it's either too big or too small. I, just, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I am in a bigger city, um, and that means probably more people are getting <laughs> from all sizes are getting rid of stuff and it ends up in thrift stores. But um, I think if you're in a big city, that would be unusual to not find something, whatever your size at a thrift yeah. store. Uh, mm-hmm. A lot of people also avoid thrifting because they they think they find a lot of old lady things, but truth be told, <laughs> I love, I love old lady things. Sure. Mm-hmm. That's where I fit all the yeah. really, really cute collars and like little little things I love old lady fashion because then I can like dress it up as my own and I think yeah. accessorizing is a big part of it too because yes. if I if I find a giant frilly oh. shirt and nothing else to go with it I'm just like well what do I do with this and then that's where you know accessorizing comes in because I feel like it pulls it all together you know and there are like you said Etsy mm-hmm. stores and a lot of people like local craftsmen they make their own uh jewelry and accessories Mm -hmm. and things like that that you can uh, accompany with any sort of outfit so also I really think that if uh, you can't find any thrift stores you want to try to support local businesses as much as possible I'm a big advocate uh, against fast fashion Uh, when I first started getting into the subculture of course uh, we all we all we've all probably been there we're all like wow we probably I mean probably Naja and I were like well we can't afford a lot of things so we probably have to go on websites like you know that uh are fast fashion websites but as, as I grew up I was like well this is really unethical and I feel like it's important to support as many local shops and local craftsmen as possible mm-hmm. so I think that's an important part yeah, I, th- I think you mentioned something that's really key uh, especially when you're first getting into it and that is the accessorizing part of it yes. um, you can I mean clothing is great but clothing as far as full body coverage and whatnot can get expensive if you're getting decent stuff. I mean, you can thrift it and it can be cheap and all that, but that you have to enjoy shopping. You have to have sort of a creative eye. You have to kind of get into that whole world. And that can be, as you've already mentioned, somewhat prohibitive to some people who aren't necessarily comfortable with that or not sure what to look for. But if you can just get some basics, just find a basic color palette, get a random shirt, some random pants, some random skirts, a random dress, whatever you want, in a basic dark color palette, whether it's just flat black or whether you're going with reds or greens or purples, whatever, um, something like that as a, as a base canvas to work with. But then you can accessorize because they're cheap with chokers and amulets and rings and earrings and your makeup and belts. And, you know, all of those things are really easy to accessorize and easy to get cheaply and are somewhat more likely, especially if you're parting things together, piecing it together, a whole outfit from, I get a little bit from this, a little bit from that, you're also going to be more likely to be unique. You're not going to be, you know, that off the rack goth look that you're going to get from a a Demonia or, you know, any of those big stores where you, you know, buy goth in a bag and just put it on. 
So I think that's the secret to getting into it. Just find some basics that work as an underlying palette and then accessorize. Put some money into accessorizing, figure out your style through accessorizing, and then build on that and then go from there. Nadia, do you have any uh, what are, do you have any tips for accessorizing, finding clothing, modifying stuff, that kind of thing? Your looks are um, so cool. Thank yeah, you. definitely. Your I mean, your fashion is <laughs> yeah, on really, point. I, I don't know what this line is now, but <laughs> thank you. Um, I take fashion very seriously. I'm very obsessed with fashion. Like I will sit there and look at fashion videos all day and read about it and all that. But um, I get asked a lot, where do you shop? I love your outfits. Do you have a specific store? I'm like, no, I thrift and stitch. That's it. <laughs> That's how I make my outfits. Like my body is very small. So when I buy outfits from thrift stores, it doesn't fit me at all. And I have to stitch it myself. Mm -hmm. yep. so that's how I make my outfits and I over accessorize with I guess corsets and I just add belt on top of the corsets and chains and I put together an outfit that's it period I think yeah so I guess as far as my advice I mean starting with a base like you said Trey is a good idea you know you can't really go wrong with like black skinny jeans a band shirt and a leather jacket um, and then it's, well, before I get to accessory, I do want to uh, just mention a few companies that I like and trust much like everyone else here. I do all my, get all my clothing thrifting now, but the few companies that I do like would be, um, Gothic lamb, Cambriel, uh, dark angel co and Dracula clothing. And then a friend of mine, um, Kate Muir and, uh, Laura McCutcheon, who, Laura runs a, another podcast on the Belfry Network. Uh, they just launched a, a new company called Coffin Apparel uh, that does locally sourced, you know, ethical uh, clothing as well. And they've got, I just ordered one of their shirts that says goth is political. And then yes. it's got quotes oh, from, uh, yeah, yeah, it's pretty, yeah. pretty cool. Awesome. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can look on eBay, you can go thrifting. Um, like Nadia said, you can't, if, a, if something's too big or too small, like, I mean, I, I do more of a death rock look, so I just do stitching up the side of the shirt if it's too big, or I'll, uh, chop it up if it's too small, maybe use it as a back patch or something like that. Um, for accessories, I think Trey mentioned as far as like you, and actually Sarah, you made it, you had an important, important point about, um, you know, everybody starts somewhere. If, if, if you don't have a pair of winks, you know, and you're wearing a, a kill star dress with doc Martens or something, don't feel like you are less of a goth because of that. Um, you know, I, like I said, I wouldn't recommend buying from fast fashion, but it doesn't make you less part of the scene. Correct. And I think that's important for accessories. Um, you know, it's not just jewelry, like you can, um, uh, cut and dye your hair, tease your hair. That's a big thing. Um, you can't, for, for jewelry, I really like Lucifer Erotica and Junkyard Bat. Um, and I'll have links, to, everything I mentioned, I'll have links in the show notes for books and, and all this stuff. So you guys can check that out. Generally, I say try and start simple uh, because you don't want to look like a Hot Topic puked on you. Um, <laughs> and because I think, so people... A lot of people will like look at Facebook group photos and see, oh, this is cool. That's cool. Use that for inspiration, but don't try and copy people. Um, especially, I know we all kind of look the same, but we, you know, you tr want to try and make it your own, right? Um, especially if you're trying to do the more extreme looks uh, right away before you know what works for your body and, and what you're into. It can come off, it can look a little weird. It can feel a bit disingenuous. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Still like get some stiletto nails, get some piercings that all, that all helps with making a look. Um, and then as far as DIY, I'm not very good at DIY. I have a couple articles, but you can, somebody mentioned glue. Like what I, when I, sometimes when I sew patches, I'll glue them with fabric glue first, just so they stay in, in place and they won't wrinkle. Um, you know, you can learn how to dye your clothing. So if you go to the thrift store and you really like something, but it's not black, you can dye it. So oh, that's yeah. something you yeah. can do. Um, you know, that kind of stuff. It's little things you learn as you just you just got to try it. You know, maybe buy some really cheap, shitty clothing that you're not going to wear just to experiment with like a cut or 
uh, asymmetrical look or whatever. And if you like that, then you can do it on your band shirt or on whatever you're going to do, that kind of thing. I see something that <laughs> just kind of again, irks me, maybe. I mean, it's too strong. But when there are people who do DIY, but it's all the same. Yeah. Like, I cannot <laughs> tell you how many times I've seen people with the exact same patches for the exact same bands and put on, like, just perfectly and just right. Like, have some originality, you know. Johnny yeah, every, was everyone amazing because yeah, yes, he yeah. was he was he was an original. You know, you don't have if you look just like him, then you're not an original. You know, it's yeah. the same thing with that stuff. It's like, and, and it's every, hard. You have to be creative and you have to think outside the goth box, but it can be done. It's so funny that you mentioned that because I was joking about my uh, friends the other day. It's like I feel like every every female presenting goth wants to look like Susie Sue. Yes, I feel like every male. <laughs> I feel like every male presenting goth doesn't, uh, they, um, we were joking about this and we were like, um, a lot of female presenting goths go like really intricate with their makeup and really, really, really like beautiful. And <laughs> there was this meme and it showed like uh, Nick Fiend and it was just like, this is how <laughs> <laughs> male yeah. presenting goths do their makeup. And yeah. I was just like, it was just so funny to me. Right. Um, I think, I think if uh, anyone can do makeup, I think really no matter what, that they're trying to present as and I feel yeah. like it's uh, it's really a term of I feel like it should be less focused on a gender thing and more focused on I'm dressing up and I'm gonna do this because it makes me feel good about myself mm-hmm. you know what I mean yeah yeah can, the makeup can, makeup thing oh I'm sorry Daniel are you going no, no. <laughs> oh good. I was just is it but kind of tagging on to that the makeup thing nowadays is so different too from from yeah. when I came up I mean everyone is it seems like is making this enormous effort to look beautiful and they do look beautiful, but that was not part of, not part of goth. You were to me, you know, in in my, I do the exact same makeup I've done (laughs) forever just because I figure it suits me. It's easy. It's fine. I don't get crazy intricate. I don't use, Oh my God, all these things. There's like all these, all these tools now that you have to use. I've seen all these videos and like, wow, you need like 10 kinds of highlighter and, Uh Con- contour and all these buffing tools like I have a <laughs> compact and that's it <laughs> I have a sponge I have yeah, a little I, sponge <laughs> yeah. I don't even have that you're ahead of me <laughs> it's, it's, it's yeah it's, it's wild I don't and I think maybe it's 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 kind of going way back to the top of the conversation in a way it's like because some of us older folks maybe came from punk and maybe mm. newer people I don't know if that's is that could be something that would be looked at, I suppose. Because that was, well, but then again, I've seen be, you know, wannabe beautiful punk makeup DIY tutorials too. So uh, it could, could be. Let well, me... I mean, even in, uh, sorry, just real quick, even in the 2000s when I, everyone had badly applied eyeliner and patchy foundation, and like it was make, it does, I was going to say the same thing basically. It's just that makeup has come a long way from what i remember it as so sorry trey go ahead that's all right i'm just gonna say that there's there's a lot in today's modern visual culture with the instagram and wanting to get likes and wanting to get a following and all of this information with makeup tutorials and fashion tutorials and all of this is about creating this sort of polished and professional look that gets likes and not necessarily subcultural likes but just likes they don't care who gets gives them likes it's just a generic number that you want to tick up so that's i think why a lot of these subcultures are looking for a very aesthetic beautiful style because that's what appeals to kind of the masses and gets you those likes so weird Um, whereas the punk aesthetic is not at all about getting likes it's about getting dislikes (laughs) Um, at least in the original (laughs) sense is all about you know how can i be up in your all all up in your face and make you uncomfortable and make you engage with things yeah, it's interesting. I like doing my makeup crazy just because I. It's like I feel very. It's not that I feel naked without it. I just like going crazy because I'm in cosmetology. I'm doing hair and makeup, mm. and I plan on doing it for a living. So I like to go a little bit crazy sometimes. But I post it on my Instagram, and I do looks on, and I dis I display my looks on TikTok mostly because I want a sort of, uh, what's it called? 
I use this word all the time, and it's very easy. It's very easy to remember. Uh, it's a, I want to, uh, it's like a, it's not even a showcase. It's like a little, it's like a little book. It's not really like a virtual book. Portfolio? So I like portfolio. Oh my gosh. gosh. How can I forget <laughs> that word? We use it all the time in class, but yeah, it's my little virtual portfolio. I like to show uh, what I do and I want to hopefully draw in clientele because if that's what I'm going to do for a living, I got to obviously show what I'm doing, you know? Mm-hmm. Can I say something? Yeah, please. Yes. Um, for me, I usually feel bad when I see other goths with makeup because my makeup is never good. Like, I have um, problems with my joints. So when I do eyeliner, one is on is going all the way up to my hairline. One is, like, going downwards. It's It just makes me feel really bad. I mean, I try, but I can never do it right. So I just do, like, regular eyeliner and call it a day. It yeah, I mean, good, yeah, Naja. Your makeup like, does look good. Yeah. Seriously, like I feel like I feel like you've you. It's you, I feel like you don't. I hate I hate to be that kind of person that's like you don't need makeup. But honestly, <laughs> for real, I think you've got it going. Like I feel like if anyone looked at you, they'd be like, "Yeah, they're goth. They're they're goth, a hundred percent." Like I feel like I feel like makeup is not a big ass. Like it shouldn't be a big aspect in your case because it. I feel like, and this is a hundred percent like a compliment. Like you, you're you're. You're, you're goth in my book, <laughs> you know, honestly. I don't know what you look like, but I, I'll, I'll follow you now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I totally agree with that. All right, so let's see if we can um, – let's see if we can close out talking about clubbing and talking about uh, making, like, making friends, getting involved with people. Um, I think as far as – Sarah, I'm sure you have a lot to say, uh, but I think as far as um, – I'm I'm really interested in maybe Nadia if you want to talk first and uh, your experience if you've had any with you know what that's been going goth clubs or events um, get-togethers um, do you have any advice for getting into that kind of thing what has your experience been like? Um, well, I've been clubbing since I was about sixteen, seventeen because my dad nice. knows people, but um, for goth clubs. I had to go by myself and with, I guess, two friends. But my first experience at a goth club, it wasn't very fun because there was a lot of creepy people and pe- people on drugs and stuff. I don't know. I mean, the last time that I went, I went for my birthday and um, I had a good time. I had made a few friends, but like towards the end, that's when people were all like touchy and like, there was this one guy, and then he was trying to, like, get my number and be all touchy-feely. And I was like, no, please, just get away from me. Creeps. Mm. Yeah, I deal with a lot of creeps when I go clubbing. You're, that's why I stopped going clubbing. You're in New York, right? Yes, no? I am. Okay. So, you know what? Off air, I will uh, I'll get in touch with you because I have, I have some friends who are DJs and part of the local scene there that are also really big advocates for... Um, inclusivity and that kind of thing so they know where the bad place I've, I've heard there are some bad places in New York but there's also some really good places so I'll get in touch with them um, and see you know what where to go and maybe even you know see if I can hook you up with a few people to hang out with or something like that but I'll, you know, I'll get in touch because that's really upsetting um, mm, yes you shouldn't have to deal with that no if I lived where you were I would I would I would defend you I would be like go away don't worry <laughs> I can. I would beat up a pedophile if I ever saw one. Too. Hell yeah! <laughs> yeah, honestly. All right. Well, uh, and Nat, what about you? What you got? Any uh, experiences, tips for? Here we go. <laughs> so I live in South Carolina. I live in it's Charleston, to be exact. Uh, I live in a very conservative uh, place. Um, there is not a huge goth scene here, and if. There is a goth scene, but it's not big, and it's uh, 21 and over, and I'm turning 20 in December, and uh, they are not letting a lot of young people in, and it really, really stinks because I want to be involved as much as possible. Um, I'm in a Facebook group, but uh, there has not been a lot of events due to COVID, and um, honestly, there aren't the only goth nights there aren't a lot of there aren't a lot of things like that there aren't any clubs in charleston south carolina there aren't any 
And it's really, it's really cool to hear everyone's story, uh, everyone's clubbing experience from around the world or in different states or different countries, um, because I don't really get that here. I really wow. don't. And it, it really sucks because I want to be involved as much as possible. But um, me and my friends uh, in Charleston, we're starting a little uh, goth uh, 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 scene for young people, me and my friend Paige. Um, and we were like, uh, I've made this post. It's like calling all Charleston goths. Are you tired of being excluded from the old people? Well, we got it. We got news <laughs> for you. So we started when we wanted to start this old little thing. So we wanted to include a lot of people who were young and who were uh, under the age of 21. So um, there was that. But that kind of felt all that but kind of like sort of not. It didn't really work as well because it was kind of unorganized. But I really hope that I can sort of start something else again because I feel like people who are younger need to experience uh, the subculture and the scene as much as possible and get their uh, feel of what it is, uh, what it's like to be, you know, a part of that sort of clubbing thing. So, yeah, I, I mean, it's it's really upsetting because there's nothing like that here. But, you know, is that I really... Mm -hmm. There was there was a goth night in God I I haven't heard about it a couple years ago called Oblivion is that still happening in Charleston Oh probably I haven't heard anything like that before I mean it probably is but it's probably so small it's probably so like little it's probably not even advertised as much I know that we need more goth events in Charleston I I will totally if and when I become of the age I will be all up in their faces like let's do this we need to start more we need to start more events because I feel like there are goth nights here but a lot of it is really small and a lot of it is not as out there as I feel like people have so much fun in different places and I want to have I want people to have that experience here mm. you know yeah I want, I want to be able to dance freely Sarah etiquette tips what to expect what what do, what, are, what do you got so i think etiquette <laughs> you know just because you're you might look goth and you're going to a goth club don't just expect that people are going to flock up to you and say ah welcome you know <laughs> it's, it's it's still it's real life church. you know yeah. yeah and i and i've had people in the past, not necessarily at my events, but I've, I've read people saying, oh, I went to a goth club and nobody talked to me. It's like, no. well, it's that doesn't, you know, don't expect that. To, that people are just going to immediately, you know, accept it. Yeah. And, and I speak from um, primarily a Chicago point of view, because that's the, the bulk of my experience. But I have DJed all over the U.S. and Europe. And the goth clubs that I've been to, people genuine, generally don't just walk up to you you observe, <laughs> you know, be, be polite, be, be confident if you can. I know that's easier for some people than others, but, it, you know, as confident as you can. Um, I think once you start dancing, too, if, if it's a club with a dance floor, um, you become less, well, hopefully, self-conscious, and then people just naturally tend to talk about music if you've been dancing to it. So you, if you've, if you've, if you're finished dancing and you want to say something to somebody, you could always, and you notice that they were dancing, you know, you could maybe say, oh, I love that song. That was so fun to dance to. Whatever. Some, some easy, you know, chilled out kind of thing. But just relax is number one. Be confident. Um, definitely dance. <laughs> I don't know. Dancing isn't everybody's thing, but if, especially if you go alone, which still to this day, I think the majority of people that come to my club events go alone they might meet up with people they know but almost everybody travels there and back by themselves um if you if you drink i don't really drink but um if you're of age and you imbibe once in a while that's okay sometimes that's just the <laughs> just the thing to get you a little more comfortable um but if you don't have a mocktail um <laughs> don't be afraid to look yeah. Silly, because we all look silly. Yeah, exactly. Oh my God. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And dancing, I, th I think you know you mentioned that Daniel, um, you were going to ask about like how to dance in the goth club. Really, uh, just don't touch other people, and you're okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah. Absolutely. As long as you're not touching anybody, and you're you're you know semi-conscious of how much space you're taking up. Some people are 
big dancers and some are not. But, try, you know, try not to be rude. But, oh, my God, the amount of really wild dancing I've seen in my years is, is amazing. <laughs> and I love it. I mean, some people, it's kind of amusing, but it's it's so heartwarming, too. It's really, yeah. everyone was just letting go and feeling the music and feeling the vibe. And it, it, if you can dance like you don't care, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> dance, dance like nobody's watching. Exactly. exactly. Life, is, I, life is too short, yeah. honestly, to yeah. worry about who's judging you and who's not judging you. Just yeah. go for it. Right. Yeah. I can definitely echo a lot of what Sarah says, um, especially you know, going out to clubs as much as I have and the way I engage with clubs. And I think one of the things that is a bit of a culture shock for people getting into the goth scene, especially if they've gone to other clubs, you know, whether it's a standard mainstream club or whatever, the, the traditional club and bar scene, I think there's a very different reason why people go to a goth club versus a standard club. A lot of people go to a standard club to meet and be met by strangers, just to meet new people, to maybe hook up, things like that. It's a very social and interactive, and I'm going to meet people so people expect that, and there is much more of that concept of being welcoming or being talked to or being, you know, wanting to be and being hit on and things like that is more of a norm, whereas people who go to goth clubs, it's oftentimes an escape, a safe place a place to meet with existing friends, not meet new people. So that's why it can sometimes, especially as you're a very new person, just entering a scene of the first time, it can be uncomfortable because a lot of the people who are there regularly go to that club because they have a handful of friends who go and they go there and they meet those friends and they hang out with those friends. And it's sometimes hard to break into that. Um, they're not expecting to try to meet or find that new person and, and meet them and pick them up or whatever. That's just not what a lot of people go to a goth club to do. So that's a very different feeling from a standard, you know, stereotypical club experience. Um, and then as, as Sarah mentioned, the uh, key on the dancing is the don't touch people. It's another big change from your standard club where we're dancing with someone physically the grinding, the whatever, you need to, you don't usually even go onto the dance floor on your own. You're expected to find a partner or someone to dance up to. There's a, there's a part of the dance floor that is that engaging and the social. And that is, I don't want to say it's quite anathema to the goth scene, but it's in that direction. There are definitely people who want to do that. There are people who like to dance together. And I've had people who, you know, want to dance physically with me and I'm sometimes okay with it and sometimes not. I'm very much a solitary dancer. I'm a little bit awkward when people dance with me, but there are people who are in the scene who do like to dance with other people and that's okay. And if they're being polite about it and I'm game for it, I'm up, I'm, I'm willing to do it, but there are people who just don't get that and will go and grind up to people. And that's completely unacceptable and being, male presenting i don't experience that too much but those who are female presenting i've heard plenty of people who have that as a massive problem yeah thankfully yeah, it's not as that. common though it is not i mean yeah it is certainly at a goth clubs because of our etiquette um, because of the way that we 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 run the clubs and how people are expected to interact on the dance floor and i think that's also why it's oftentimes viewed as a safe space um, and then, of course, with the drinking, I'm also a non-drinker. But the only rule I have around drinking is if you're going to drink, don't do it on the dance floor. Oh, thank oh, you. God. Yeah. <laughs> it drives me crazy. Oh, my God. I'm like, put that drink down. Yeah. And that, that's my that's I don't care if you drink. I don't care if you get all sloppy drunk. Just do it over there. There's spaces to drink. There are tables. There's the bar. Just drink and socialize. Put your drink. Down. Well, the advice to put your drink down and dance is a uh, very male privileged point of view. I would understand um have your friends watch it yeah but that's hard if you go alone so you know just be cognizant of all of that the bartenders are good for that hopefully yes yeah and don't be afraid to ask bartenders for anything like that or for any kind of help if you're new to nightclubs in general i mean they're there they're part of the hospitality and you know industry so yeah. they they want their patrons to feel comfortable mm -hmm. yeah 
As far as drinking goes, I would also also mention um, if you well, unless of course you don't drink. Um, but if you're going to a night and there's no cover charge, uh, buy a drink at least. Oh hell yeah! Um, you know, tip the DJ if you don't drink, maybe. But uh, it's you yeah. know you gotta tip your bar, <laughs> tip your bartender, tip the bartender. Okay. I mean yeah, support we get, we get support paid. the people. Okay, okay. Yeah. Support the venue somehow. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And as far as uh, what to drink, <laughs> I know the the, the stereotypical goth drinks Absinthe of and my red day. wine only. That's well, it. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> uh, I think my from heart might be. <laughs> 1988 to probably 1999, virtually everyone I that was at Nocturno that was drinking was drinking either vodka cranberries mm. or red wine, and yeah. and in all my my <laughs> time hanging out in goth events in England, 100 <laughs> snake bite and black. Bite and black, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I drink red. I drink whatever's got a lot of caffeine, Red Bull or whatever. So, so that's my hard stuff yes. nowadays. <laughs> yes. So my, um, I, did anybody else want to pop in there? I just wanted to say tips. Uh, always watch your drink. And if you're going to put it down or keep it like next to you on a table, cover it with a napkin. Ooh. And um Bring an escort. Nowadays, things are wild, so I would definitely say bring an escort with you and not go clubbing alone if you're new to the scene. Yeah. Probably depends a lot on where you are, too. Yeah. Um, another thing that I, I have implemented in Chicago years ago is I noticed sometimes there were people who would be at one of my club nights alone all night long and seemed to enjoy it because they were there. They didn't leave. You know, until quite late, but they were alone. So I started the Chicago chapter of the Goth Meetup, um, which became quite a thing where people felt like they could meet each other outside of a club, but still in a goth specific setting. Mm. And then once they met each other in a more of a an easier yes. environment that wasn't loud and full of, you know, dark and you could talk and there was a little more structure to it. They, they felt like they'd made these acquaintances that then they could meet up with or travel together to a club. Um, I, I, I know that goth meetups exist in quite a few places, but if they don't and, and someone out there is you know looking to do one, it, I, I would highly recommend that. I'm a huge proponent of doing that. Um, my I've, I've done things on any scale from as small as um i i was doing i mean obviously we have an, a problem now but uh i was doing uh semi-annual uh, gaming nights at my house and every time i had people over it would just be a small group of people but i would always make sure i invited different people so that we could especially if i when i ran into new people there's a whole there was a whole like five or six new goths that I met and I was always trying to it get new people old people like a bunch of people mixed together you can do small things like that all the way up to I've done uh, I've been doing uh, the, a renaissance fair meetup uh, every year where just everybody is invited or stuff like there's a Halloween flea market uh, nearby Sarah I know you run goth flea market a goth flea market thing you can do you know just send out a big uh, group message and say hey there, here's this thing going on does everybody want to meet up at this time and, and hang out? And that's a good thing to do. That's such like, a good idea. Get little gaming nights at your house. It's so, it's so yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah. Get drunk, I, play games, whatever. Yeah. You know? yeah. Mario Kart. Goth, goth clubbing. Mario Kart. <laughs> like, gothic clubbing, I think, is, is kind of like the you know, the pinnacle of, of, mm -hmm. you know, yep. of, of the goth scene. But there's a lot of other things you can do for the for the subculture that aren't in a nightclub setting that can help that grow but just can kind of connect people uh, that's another reason why um i think one of you mentioned your, your like your club was only 21 and over and i i make a point of doing my big club night at a venue that is legally able to do 18 plus even though it's a bigger pain in the ass for me and it's more expensive oh, yeah. but it's just it's worthwhile to be able to, to include more people that aren't just 21. I think by the time sometimes you're 21, if you've been interested in goth and you had no outlet for it, you might lose interest possibly. Mm -hmm. You don't feel any connection with anyone else. 
Yeah, we're big proponents on this show of emphasizing the community aspect of goth. Even if you don't have it in person, I mean, you can find it online, but in person especially. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, you know, so my, I, I, my experience went, because I took a big break from, I had a group of friends in Chicago that didn't really go out clubbing, but they were goths and we hung out. And then I had a kid and I had some ideological differences with them. So I had this sort of period where I didn't have a good connection. So what I did when I was trying to get involved in a community, I don't know if this will work for everybody, but this is what I did. I I literally uh, went to Facebook events and I would look through the RSVP list and try to find people who lived in the suburbs around my area. And then I would send them friend requests and messages and just be like, hey, I'm trying to meet new friends. You know, do you want to do a get together? Do you want to ride to a club event? That kind of thing. I've, I've even seen people post directly to events and say, this is where I live. And Sarah, you've tried to help connect people like who can give this person a ride. And that's really good. If you can get a ride with someone, that's that at least for me that was a good experience because that was like my designated extrovert so i got to meet their friend group and then once i met their friend group i could then meet those people's friends friend groups right and you kind of go out from there and so i know i know it's not everyone is extroverted but you can even i've had many good experiences going out to like the smoking patio and just say I mean, if you don't smoke, that's fine. I don't smoke anymore. But going out and just finding a group of people and introducing yourself. And every time I've done that, everyone has just been really friendly. Yeah. And even if it's just like a lim- ephemeral, you chat with these people for 20 minutes and never see them again. You, you, That's enough to feel like you are then connected with the community. Yeah. And I feel like uh, I, I, I feel like when you're at these events, uh, you, you're in constant fear of, oh, my gosh, are they judging me? But I've learned over the years that I don't feel like anyone's really judging you. I feel like at the end of the day, they're kind of worried about their own selves and their own problems. So I feel like, you know, mm-hmm. life's too short. Why don't you just walk up there and just say something? But of course, a lot of people don't have the ability to do so. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I, I honestly, Nadia, you said bring bring someone. I think I'd bring a friend or something and then we'd both walk up to them and we'd both say hey you guys look cool uh let's chat up a little bit and even like you said even if it's for like 20 minutes and you never see it again it's really it's a really it's really happy that you actually went out of your way to talk to people and makes you feel like you've accomplished something a little bit yeah and you you know you can uh message the promoter or the dj and tell that you know tell them you're new and they you know they they want the community to be there and i'm sure they can point you to somebody that would be like a friendly person that would love to meet you and introduce you to people that's always an option too i do that all the time when people comment like oh this is going to be my first time um i'll write to them directly or post publicly saying hey well make sure you come up to me because i'm easy to Mm -hmm. find because i'm in the Mm -hmm. dj booth Mm -hmm. and and introduce yourself, and then I'll introduce you to some people. Yeah. And there, you now you're not alone. You know? yeah. And of course, I'm, I make a point of telling them I'm not going to introduce them to anyone that I didn't, I wouldn't personally vouch for. Yeah, which that's also important because especially when you're new, you don't... <laughs> the goth scene is generally safe, but it is small. And so you have, you know, that trope of everyone's dated everyone, so not everybody talks to each other and... You know, not so if you have a safe person like the, you would assume the DJ and promoter is a safe person that would know who's good to uh, to get introduced to. That's also a great way to avoid that uh, pitfall. For sure. Yeah. There was awesome. a topic that was interesting that you had written down on the list. Goths and the dating scene. And I think it's really interesting. And my my partner is not goth, which is really interesting because, mm. you know, uh, we both have different music tastes. And as of recently, uh, they were uh, they were talking to me and they're like, you know, I've actually we've, we've been together for two years. And uh, every time I play my music, uh, they get really irritated because <laughs> because it's like very different. But um, I talked to them for a little bit and they were like, well, you know what? I think this is a really good opportunity to maybe open my mind for a little bit and uh, uh, open my heart to new music. So I, they're they're going to take a time to um, 
for me to info dump on them for, as, for a, a, a bunch of bands that I really like. And I think that's really great. Um, I think, I think uh, there aren't really a lot of uh, goths in Charleston uh, as far as in the dating scene here, but I don't know. That's just a little thing that I saw on the list. That I found really well, interesting. I think, yeah. I think that's important because it kind of, as far as going back to identity is concerned, you don't, uh try especially when you're getting into something you don't want to try and put on a fully formed identity and just be something that's already made for you have other interests have other things that you're involved in and if you you don't have to date someone who's also goth you can find people that have similar interests to you and uh you know there's nothing that's totally fine it's like the same it's like this people that ask like is it okay can I still be goth and listen to music that's not goth exactly. as well as goth music and it's like yes, yes please course. don't be and boring. There are other, yeah. And there are other if aspects that can connect you in your partner besides the music. So yeah. I really think yeah. you know if you're if you're dating as a goth person, you can connect to other people. Like like you know my partner and I really like video games and my partner and I really like certain shows, but we're I think the most important thing is like being connected emotionally and, and spiritually and I think that's I think really music is such a te- not really a tedious thing, but it's such a little thing that I really honestly, as much as I, it's very important to me, it's such a little aspect of any of my relationship with them. So I think it's really important that you know. Oh, I do. I do have dating advice. I have a little a little dating advice because I don't. I've been married for a long time. But first, first of all, um, respect yourself because if you're dating in the goth scene, you are not an accessory. You're not a leather jacket. Yeah. You know, yes, relationships right. are about more than looking hot at social events. Yeah. So make sure you're being treated well. Um, and then the other thing is my other advice was be as honest as you can be, even if your answer is that you're not sure about something. Because what I have found in the goth scene is there's a huge range of people from, you know, people that are poly, people that don't date at all. Um, people who are really into platonic touching, people who would find that uh, to be flirting, people all over the queer spectrum. So I think it's best to you can. I think you can still be romantic, and I think goth can be a romantic community. You know, you can write shitty poetry and go on cemetery picnics and all that kind of stuff. But as far as your intentions and and who you are, make sure you're being honest with people. Absolutely, and I think uh, it's really important. Uh, you were saying that, um, like, I, I feel like in any relationship, goth or not, uh, communication is key and trust is key. And you were saying, I feel like, uh, don't, uh, with the whole accessory aspect, uh, there's a whole, like, stigma about having a goth girlfriend. Yeah. Not, like, not I, sure you probably know this because yeah. it's the stupid meme that, like, yep. oh, you're, you're not, a, you're not a, real, a real man unless you got a goth girlfriend or whatever. And oh I think it's gosh. really degrading. It's yeah. extremely degrading. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I, like, I can't help but cringe at, like, the fact that these, like, people are just, they, they see uh, goth women as a little, uh, as a side, as a side, uh, as a toy and it really yeah. is like, an, a, like, yeah. like, like a handbag it's like what? it's a box to check have you ever been with a goth girl and you check that off with your list and move on with your life and it's a, a little notch to to make on your little conquest board and it's pathetic it really yeah. is honestly mm-hmm. and i Thank feel like you have, you've got to watch out for those people honestly definitely watch out for people who are predatory and only see you as one thing one little thing and this could apply for and for any gender really you know what i'm saying yeah, yeah. thankfully yeah. that's never happened to me but i i can see it especially nowadays i mean before nobody you know if you weren't part of the goth scene in the old days it was like you didn't really have much of a to worry about people wanting to date you because they thought you were the weirdo and now it's, <laughs> now, it's, now, it's yeah. now it's pure fetish fetishizing and objectifying yeah yeah Mm -hmm. i mean i don't i i I think all my relationships have been with goth (laughs) i I married william faith so i don't know how much more goth you can get but there is yeah yeah but that's just we share a whole lot of interests not just goth but that's exactly you've got to like you've got to like branch not like not just branch out but like see other aspects in your partner that that aren't just the music and the fashion and things like that 
you're gonna you're gonna run out of stuff to talk about and get sick of each other real fast if there's nothing else. Yeah, <laughs> joke about things, you know. Like, I mean, like I don't see how one person could just connect just over music. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah it's it's like it's not like being goth makes you this particularly unique person when it comes to love life. It's still the same rules that apply to relationships apply to goths and relationships. It's about a whole person. It's about understanding and having this connection over deep things that are part of your core being, not these superficial aspects that are that are likes and interests and things like that. It's great to have those. And it is convenient in a relationship when you share those because a relationship is about sharing things and sharing a life and sharing activities. So if there's nothing in common, that's going to struggle. But if there are things that are different, that's, you know, like not your, you and your, your current partner are experiencing, that's a broadening experience. That's usually a good thing if you have different interests because you can teach each other. And I think that's a great way to grow. And I think that's really important to have. Um, and I'd say the, the like I love teaching my wife how to peg me. That's really important. Ah. It's really very important. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, but you're going on with the idea of the goth and non-goth dating. The I'd say the most important things about that um, and and navigating that space is one. Don't try to make your partner a goth. If they want to be great. Yeah. If yeah. they don't want to be great. You have ideally if you're you know doing a smart thing in a relationship, you have other things to to bond over. But also, on the flip side, as a danger sign, be cautious of people who try to change you mm-hmm. and are pushing on the, oh, it's just yeah. a phase and you'll grow out of it and let me help push you in this and let me get you into these oh. normal things. Those are danger signs because they're not accepting you for you. They're wanting you to be something else. So don't do that to your partner and be careful when they try to do it to you. Sure. I, hate, I hate to be one to like... <laughs> I, I, it's just, it's just, uh, I think it's just really nice when you have someone like, uh, like I said before, my partner's not really into the music, but they're just, uh, you, when, when you find someone, you find someone, you can genuinely feel that connection. It doesn't just have to be on, you know, an interest based level. It's just really nice to find someone that can truly live with you and like, you know, you know what I mean? I don't know. Yeah. I'm getting sappy right now. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm really, yeah, it's nice to be in love. All right. Was there anything else anyone had something they wanted to, to share about before I uh, kick you all out? I don't want to step over anyone or I want to give you all space to speak. I have kind of a question, but it's <laughs> it might lead to an entirely other episode. <laughs> <as well. laughs> and I'm not, I'm not the one doing the interviewing, but it is something that I'd like to maybe maybe. Maybe we'll just have a phone call one time about this, mm. Daniel. Um, just kind of this whole notion of of joining the goth subculture. I'd like to hear mm. a, different perspectives on that and different generations speak about that because it's it's like the idea of joining rather than just being or becoming. Yeah, yeah. right. Like yeah. there's things that you kind of have to check off, or that thing right. that's this or this and you know what do you have to do or be or say or or like That's a good point. i know i've definitely talked about that on previous episodes because yeah. i have a very There's strong no conviction about you know when people are trying to be goth whether it's you know what music should i listen to or what clothes should i wear or, or what should i do what event should i go to my first question is always well you know why is it important to you to be goth what is it about being goth in the abstract that's so important that you want to, you know, maybe change yourself to be a part of that rather than you already know who you are, or have an experience of what you like, and you find that goth matches that and you sort of fall into it. So it's this idea of intentionally joining something to join it versus finding your people because you discovered who you were and then falling into, oh, this is my these are my people. And I think there is a, I think that is becoming something more prevalent today is, is this concept of needing to choose and then fix yourself so you fit. And I think that is dangerous. Mm-hmm. Oh man. I, I, yeah. I post only events really, but in the, the Gothic Amino, I know Daniel, you have a profile there. 
Yeah, I don't use and, it anymore. But oh yeah. man, it's just full, and it's very very young people. So I think maybe mm-hmm. it is just young, but um, yeah, it's weird. I just I, again, I, it makes me feel a little more disconnected from like, well, what I feel is goth is not at all what it seems like the majority of younger people are. And I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, but that's if it helps. It if it helps, Gothic Amino is kind of a weird little ecosystem in its own that I've heard a lot of people complain about. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, I completely agree with, with what Trey said. The the concept behind, I mean, using the the term "joining Goth" was just more of a phrase of uh, of uh, uh, practicality and utilitarian kind of phrase rather than any sort of statement of how to become goth because I think identity formation is much more complex and uh, emergent and uh, less about trying to be something else. It's, it is more just about being who you are. And I don't really have any good way of talking about that other than through philosophy. And that is going to get into a whole other thing. But uh, if it helps, I think in practice and in concept, I would agree with your position on that <laughs> if that makes you feel any better the way that you feel about it. So, um, yeah, it's not a, it's, it's not a checkbox. It's not a, you do these things, you're goth. It's a, I'm interested in understanding and furthering my passion kind of thing. The whole goth card thing. <laughs> yeah. I'm revoking your goth card because you can't shit out five bats at once. <laughs> I, like, I, feel, I feel like the term goth card is very silly to me, but oh, I, I like to, I like to was, joke about it. It was started by net goths in the, you know, mm-hmm. the 90s as, as a joke. Yep. And yes. the fact yep. that anybody yep. takes it seriously is is oh, also baffling. Missing the point. Then, but there are yeah, people yeah, who take yeah. it seriously. I know. It's so funny. <laughs> it's like, it's why it was, baffling. <laughs> yeah. how, how, how can you take it seriously? It's just yeah. so silly. Yeah. Oh, I said it jokingly to somebody once online, like, oh, I'm taking away your goth card. Mm-hmm. And wow, wow, did they get really upset. <laughs> and I don't know. I feel like, like you shouldn't be so insecure in your gothness that you have to be, like, I don't know, uh, yeah. degrading of other people's gothness as well. So it's like, it's yeah. like I, I get when people are, like, kind of, I guess when, when people are kind of upset because they're kind of, like, like, around this sort of insecure, like, am I goth enough sort of thing, but... Really, if you're in the subculture and you, you surround yourself with the people, the right people, and you educate yourself about the music and the political background, you, I feel like I feel like that's a good start. And I feel like there shouldn't be mm-hmm. there should not be a goth card. Like what? Is, what? <laughs> well, I think that's a whole other part of of the goth community that's really special for me is just the whole self referential, you know, parody kind of thing where we can take ourselves seriously and also laugh at how seriously we take ourselves. Like I, I love that. Like the term <laughs> gothic. <laughs> yeah. Hello, my DJ name is Scary Lady. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> that was a joke. We're all taking stuck. a piss. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind of silly, but. All right. Well, this was absolutely lovely. I had a great time. Thank you all so much. Okay. Yes, this it was went great. By fast. <laughs> Bye, Thanks again. Bye. 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 And thank you for hanging out with us. Unfortunately, our time has come to a close. As I teased earlier in the episode, our next show, which is going to be in two weeks, on uh, coming out on the 16th, will be an interview, different style of show. We're going to be talking with a House state representative about her journey into politics and her identity as a goth and how either of those things make sense, how they inform each other, how they don't inform each other. So I think that's going to be a really unique show. If you do like Cemetery Confessions and this is your first time checking us out, a little information about us. Each episode, we have a different guest on. There's a few different styles of episode, but you can listen to us through almost any audio format. We're on YouTube. You can listen on the website. You can subscribe in any podcast app on Android or Apple, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, uh, Stitcher, Spotify, whatever you want to grab us on, you can listen And uh, we do exactly this. Each episode, we tackle a different topic and explore it to the best of our ability. 
I definitely recommend going through our back catalog. Generally, I just say go backwards from this one. You know, listen to the episode before this. Listen to the episode before that. Uh, if you want to take a look at the last year or two and uh, see which which title, uh, which episode title stands out to you, if it's a topic you're interested in or a guest that you want to hear from. And then finally, of course, if you want to support the show financially, get some extra content, you can head over to patreon.com slash cemetery confessions and see what kind of rewards you can get for throwing us a dollar or more every month. Our members at Patreon, we are eternally grateful for because that is what enables us to create these episodes. So thank you again so much for taking time out of your day to hang out with me, uh, hang out with Trey and everyone on this episode. We will be back, but until next time, stay dark. The preceding program is a member of The Belfry, a network of blogs, podcasts, and videos for the darkly inclined. Go to thebelfry.rip for more information. 